Hello and welcome to another fun-filled edition of Adam's Music Box, where today I want to talk about Wagner. We've talked about him before on this channel, but today I want to talk about how among the many things he invented as one of the most important musicians of all time, one of the very important things he invented was modern conducting. Now, a lot of people, including some people who love listening to music, don't understand that the conductor's role in a classical European orchestra, particularly a symphony orchestra or an operatic orchestra, his or her role is as important as that of the composer. Because if the composer provides the roadmap for where the music is going to go, the conductor is the driver. The conductor sets the tempo, the mood, the variations of the mood, variations of the tempo, variations of the dynamics, all of which a good conductor knows can change from second to second if needed. And in a lot of music, especially the great music of the 19th century, that golden age of European classical music, regular shifts in all of those things uh, are very frequent. And Wagner complained early on about the low quality of conductors in his in his youth that he encountered in the Germanic realms, because Germany obviously wouldn't become a United State until later in Wagner's life. Wagner was a great advocate for this. Nietzsche, his erstwhile friend, was not. That's another story. Uh, but he complained that there was what he called a cultureless attitude among conductors who masked their lack of talent and lack of understanding of music and lack of a broader philosophical and intuitive relationship to culture by adopting what he called a classicist style of conducting, where they just beat a steady tempo with their hands as though they were a human metronome whose only goal was to keep the orchestra together, uh, which might be a very important goal for a youth symphony conductor, but not necessarily for a conductor of great music uh playing great music for money um and so he complained about this and talked about how there was a radical divorce between the compose the intent of these great composers and this style of conducting a style of conducting that while taking comparatively little talent to execute it justified itself by saying oh it's classical it's prim and proper and this pseudo culture was called out by wagner and Wagner pointed out to the fact that his style of conducting was one that let the melody define the tempo, which is something that separates European classical music from many other genres of classical music, where it's the tempo that defines the melody. Think of Indian raga. Think of the master drumming classical music of West Africa. Um, think of even Chinese classical music. Here we see uh, very clearly that it's the tempo or tempi, multiple, you know, plural, that define the melody. But in true European classical music, whether Italian, German, French, or uh, the other schools, uh, it is the melody that must define the tempo. And this necessarily means that the tempo has got to be flexible over the course of a piece. This was something that Wagner implicitly understood, and he wrote about this in his On Conducting essay and in other essays that he wrote on the subject. And he mentioned that when he was conducting um, a, a Weber overture, uh, it was Weber's wife, I think, who told him, I haven't heard it like this since my husband was alive, because he conducted it this way. People who were alive when Beethoven was alive said, ah, Wagner did it the way Beethoven did it in his lifetime, which showed that the great composers always knew that tempo needs to be flexible. It needs to follow the melody. It cannot be wedded to random metronomical markings on a page, markings that Wagner said should be as generic as possible so as to avoid people confusing authenticity for obedience. And as such, Wagner created a modern school of conducting that in the second half of the 19th century and well into the 20th century became the dominant 
dominant form of conducting in the European classical tradition. In Wagner's own lifetime, great conductors included Hans von Bülow and Hans Richter, who premiered many of his works. And just slightly later, you had the great Arthur Nikesh, who even survived very early into the age of recorded sound. The generation of Nikesh produced some of the finest conductors we have on record of this Wagnerian style of conducting. And those two men are my two favorite conductors that I've heard with my ears. Uh, this was, of course, um, uh, Wilhelm Furtwängler and, uh, and Wilhelm Mengelberg. Furtwängler being associated with the Berlin Philharmonic, Mengelberg being associated with the Concert de Bav Orchestra in, um, in Amsterdam. Um, Franz Schlock was another great one who was both in the recorded age and Wagner's age. And what all of these conductors had in common among uh, among the very, they were, they had a lot of differences, but what they had in common was something we refer to as tempo rubato, a term that Wagner didn't use. He preferred German to Italian terms, but this term meant that tempo needs to be at all times flexible. It cannot follow a uh, you know like a hammer and one of the things that Wagner talked about uh, in his time was that when you had people playing transcriptions of great symphonies for piano or for piano quartet or piano for four hands, you got this tempo rubato because when you're a solo artist or in a small group of musicians, the tempo naturally ebbs and flows based on the emotional understanding of the performer in relationship to his or her knowledge of the piece. But when you have a bad orchestra and because um it's more difficult to put together a good orchestra than a good chamber group uh you sometimes see the pieces reduced to this mere boring metronomical time beating and uh, Wagner had a very interesting uh, philosophical interpretation of this he said a lot of people have a beautiful memory of a piece because of the chamber music or solo piano performance that they've heard of it and they just sort of erase from their memory this terrible orchestral performance even though it's an orchestral piece Wagner of course corrected this his protégés corrected this and this gave way to an era of such wonderful performance it was an era in the uh, 19th and, and first half of the 20th century when European classical performance was at its most refined and it's most sophisticated. And then something happened that ruined it all. And this was called the historically informed uh, performance or HIP, H-I-P movement, which began as a sort of underground movement in the 60s. But by the final decades of the 20th century, it began to really weave its way into mainstream performances. This stripped away everything that Wagner talked about and brought orchestras back to very unidimensional tempo, you know, time beating conductors, very narrow dynamics, and some even played uh, music on instruments that were obsolete and didn't have this the beautiful sonoral uh, on a, a qualities of modern musical instruments and Wagner himself kind of anticipated this over a hundred years earlier uh, remarking that Beethoven was such a genius because he could anticipate that it would actually take an orchestra with more sophisticated instruments than the the ones available in Beethoven's own lifetime to really bring it to life. And so these people who have ruined classical music and made it boring as hell, they claim that what they're doing is authentic, but it isn't even that. Because as we know from those who documented Beethoven, as we know from Wagner's experience with Weber, we know for a fact that the composers themselves uh, who existed in this era, this late classical era that these HIP people are so quick to ruin, they conducted like Wagner and like, and by extrapolation, like Furtwängler, like Mengelberg, who we have on record. Um, and that's why if you go into a classical performance today and leave thinking that was a bit dry, that was a bit stale, that was a bit boring, a bit metronomic, you probably wouldn't be wrong because a lot of performances are like that. I walk out, 
I've stopped going. <laughs> Wagner did the same, but he fixed it because of his prominent role in music. And for at least a, a hundred years, more than a hundred years, the Wagnerian style of conducting did reign supreme. And luckily we've got a lot of it on record. So that is how Wagner changed the way that classical music sounded in Europe and places where European classical music is loved and consumed. Like, subscribe. We will see you next time. Take care.